This is as awkward as I remember it. Hey everybody, tonight's video comes to us care of a comment from a viewer. We've arrived at a national park. We are miles from any other point of civilization. There is nowhere to go to get our equipment fixed. We don't know if the issues with the laptop, with the cable, with the mount. All we know that the only way to control the mount is with the hand controller. So what I'm going to attempt tonight is to polar align my scope using just a hand controller, well enough to be able to do astrophotography. Now I know that I can align my wedge well enough to be able to do 15 second exposures because that is what I used to do with my uh, makeshift homemade wedge. So my real goal is to be able to get to 30 to 60 second exposures with limited star trailing. Luckily, I've already made a video all about wedges and how to use them. And I've brought the right equipment, which includes a compass to make sure that I can line up one of the legs of my tripod to face true north, not magnetic north, and the level so that I can level my tripod side to side. Now we're going to be pointing to uh, geographic north, so true north, not magnetic. And I know for, <clears throat> excuse me, my position where I'm situated that uh, true north is actually about 10 degrees to the right of magnetic north. So I'm going to take my little compass. Uh, I'm going to set it to an offset of 10 degrees. Okay, so this is saying that direction of that arrow, not the red arrow, but the black arrow uh, from the compass is pointing to true north. And I can verify that with my phone. So I'm going to set my phone to use true north on the compass. That's pretty close. So that is true north and magnetic north is going to be somewhere to the left. By the way, I'm not putting my phone or the compass up here because I found that uh, the metal in the uh, mount actually interferes with the compass readings. Can I line this up a little better? Yeah, that's pretty close. That's a good starting point. Step two, we need to level the mount. All right, so I can tell right now that the mount is not level side to side. I don't care if it's level front and back, but side to side, I need it to be as close as possible. All right, I've lowered one of the legs of the tripod. And now, looks like I am pretty much level. I'll be honest, I'm pretty confident in what I need to do. Uh, on the surface, it's pretty simple and I've given it some thought. If I'm confident that the scope is level or as level as it can be, and that my OTA is parallel to the mount itself, to the wedge, uh, then um, I should be pointing at the meridian and at the celestial equator. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, run through a basic alignment and whatever this first star is uh, that it wants me to go to, I'm going to physically shift my mount until it's pretty much lined up on that first star. Looking back, the first warning sign was that I had to dig up the instructions on how to use the hand controller. I've already positioned my mount as near perfectly to north-south aligned as I could get. And I've lined up my tick marks, making sure that, at least visually, my scope is parallel to my wedge. So now, I'm going to do an EQ North align. And then I'm going to pan over to the celestial equator and meridian, and I'm going to do a manual drift alignment. So I'm going to watch for which direction stars are going to be trailing in as I take long-term exposures. And then I will be adjusting my azimuth. And then later on, as I pan to the west, my altitude until the stars are no longer drifting. This is a wireframe of the sky, similar to those that we look at when we look at star charts. That's the meridian down the middle, and there across side to side is the celestial equator. Now, if your wedge is off in alignment, left to right, let's say it's to the left or to the east, 
then the path that your scope is going to take as it tracks across the celestial equator is going to be at an angle to the way that the stars are traveling across the actual celestial equator. And this will result in star trailing. If your wedge is off to the right or to the west, then the angle will be in the opposite direction and the star trailing will be in the opposite direction as well. If we're looking at a star further west, uh, away from the meridian, and our declination is off, then we will also get star trailing. As the star tries to follow the curve of motion higher up in the sky, which takes it away from the path that the scope would be trying to follow, which it thinks would be closer to the celestial equator. This is because the higher an object is in the sky, the tighter the circle it makes as it revolves around the polar axis. So this is where I ran into my first real issue. I was under the impression that I could do the same type of alignment that I was used to with CPWI, meaning I would pick a star, the scope would slew to that star, and then whatever amount it would be off by, I would be confident in my north-south alignment and in the position of my scope against the wedge uh, plate, and then I could shift the scope into position so that it would point at that star. And that would give me a good starting point from which I could jump right into a drift alignment. That's not the way EQ North alignment works when using the next star mount. The hand controller already assumes that you have good polar alignment, and it just asks you to go to the star that you've selected. It doesn't slew to the star for you. What this meant was that the position of my tripod in terms of aligning north-south, the angle of my wedge, and the position of the OTA being parallel to the wedge plate itself, all had to be perfect before I started. And without an option to do an all-star polar alignment from the next star controller, without star sense, which I believe does have that functionality, I had to go right into a drift alignment. And the starting point for that drift alignment was potentially a much worse position since I had no way of knowing how accurately I had positioned the mount so far. Mode. Yeah, let's go into tracking mode. And I've got it set to EQ North. And I've got it set to Sidereal because I don't want solar or lunar. I just want to track the stars. And that's important. Okay, here we go. Uh, begin alignment. Press enter. Sky align. Two star. One star. Solar system. EQ north. Enter. Custom site. Uh, I'm going to have to look these up. So it wants us to go to the southernmost star in Cygnus. You know what? I'm not doing this one. I'm doing Altair. That is way too high in the sky for me to crane my neck. Uh, finder scope. Check. Uh, centered. Okay, center object and eyepiece. Well, for that, we're going to use the laptop. So let's go over to the laptop. This is as awkward as I remember it. Okay. There's the laptop. A little more. Okay. Okay. That is centered. Press enter. Use direction buttons to center object in the eyepiece. Press align. Done. Okay. Align success. Okay. So, in theory, we're aligned, and that's it, we're tracking. Okay, as we can see here, uh, things have settled down. Pretty stable, at least, uh, at least to my eye it looks stable. So I'm going to take a 30 second exposure and just see which way things are going. From this, I am trailing up and to the right, which means I have to turn this. 
It's very important after every major adjustment to let the scope settle. This is just the backlash compensation. From here on out, it was a matter of making iterative adjustments with the scope pointing at the meridian and the celestial equator, I would take 30 second exposures and check which way the stars were trailing. I would then make small incremental updates to the azimuth and then I would retake a 30 second exposure to see the impact on the star trails until they were gone. And then I slewed the scope to the west along the celestial equator and repeated the process with declination. I would take 30 second exposures, I would check which way the stars would trail and I would make small adjustments to the declination knob until the star trails were gone. When I was done, I resynced on Altair. So here is a 30 second exposure at the equator and the meridian. And that looks pretty good to me. All right, I think tonight uh, I'm going to try to image M15. Let's see, Messier. Uh, 15. Well, looks like all the tests are done. All right, so what I'm going to do now uh, is I'm going to do my sky flats. I'm going to use my UPPD mat, and I'm going to do my flats. And then uh, what I was thinking of doing was turning on guiding for the rest of the night and doing three-minute exposures to capture the uh, same object, so M15, a globular cluster, running that for the rest of the night while I get some sleep. In the end, I ended up capturing three different sets of data. I captured 15 second exposures, 30 second exposures, and 60 second exposures. And I captured 20 minutes of each. And I did that in a plan that was staggered so that I would run 10 minutes of each and then another 10 minutes of each. So that way I had them all spaced out throughout the uh, capture session. Out of all of that, I was able to get 27 frames of 15 second exposures which amounts to just under seven minutes worth of data. And I was able to get 14 frames of 30 second exposures, which is seven minutes worth of data. So we're looking at about the same type of um, output of both. Now, because we're capturing a globular cluster, what's important here isn't any kind of nebulosity, but rather the sharpness of the stars themselves. So I was uh, very strict about which frames I kept and which ones I excluded. Um, had I been capturing a nebula, I may have been a little bit more lenient. Uh, I probably would have kept 50-60% of the frames uh, and not the 40% uh, or so that I ended up with. Of the 60 second exposures, I only had one useful frame. Periodically, uh, something within the gearing of the mount is going to cause my right ascension to shift every minute or so so i cannot do any more than 30 seconds i may be able to push it to 40 45 depending on how cyclical the deviation is but i definitely can't do 60 seconds and that's a physical hard limitation with my mount personally your mount might be different you might be lucky your mount might be worse in which case i feel for you uh, but this is what i'm getting Anyway, so for the final results, here's what I was able to uh, stack and then do some basic stretching on for comparison. 
This is the 15 second uh, captures. And this is the 30 second captures. And from what I can tell, they are very, very similar. Uh, I tried to keep the stretches similar between both uh, images. I wasn't exact on them, I was eyeballing it, but uh, I think I was close in the stretching. And to my eyes, at least, the two images seem very, very similar. The sharpness of the stars, the level of detail in the images, uh, they're pretty much the same. In fact, to me, the biggest difference between both the 15 second and the 30 second exposures is that with the 30 second exposures, I have exactly half the number of files as of the 15 second exposures, which is fantastic because that is a huge amount of space savings on my hard drive, as well as a big reduction in the amount of processing I have to do afterwards when stacking. So in summary, yes, you can absolutely do polar alignment manually using a hand controller and some basic drift alignment uh, with a Alt-AZ mount on a wedge. It is possible. Uh, the unguided tracking is not going to be as good as guided tracking because guided tracking takes into account cyclical deviations in your mount and in fact has a uh, or rather, <clears throat> in fact, PHD2 has a predictive algorithm where it looks for these cyclical patterns and gets in front of them to offset the deviations, which is why I'm able to get uh, mostly useful frames when doing guided image capture. Um, so for me, the frames that I end up losing are usually the ones where there is a gust of wind or some other interference with the mount. So thanks for dropping me that question. Uh, this was a fun investigation. I hope you guys found this useful. And until next time, thanks for watching and clear skies.